been a week of opportunities, a week of uh, <laughs> event challenges, you name it. I've got a couple of announcements. First thing is uh, talk about something that actually makes me really uncomfortable. It's awful. Uh, we do have bills, we do have expenses now. Um, Online, there's an ability to what, hit and donate on Facebook. Uh, PayPal me. PayPal me. Now, can you hear me? If you support this ministry, we're asking you to give to the ministry. We're asking you to donate. It's hard to talk about that kind of stuff, and people start throwing up red flags immediately. Um, even in my own heart, red flags start throwing up like a lot of disaster. I used to do one more month. Well, this ministry, it, does, it runs on faith, so <laughs> you have bills to pay now. And so we're asking you, if you are blessed by this ministry, even on mine, if you're blessed by this ministry, to give. Um, to give as you purposed in your heart. Is that clear things up? Just tell them how to give. That's on a kiosk. Beard looks amazing, brother. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Go Thank to, you guys, my baby brother. On Facebook. <laughs> Facebook donate. It's, it's in the about section. Uh, and then the PayPal. Just click. You don't have to give your information. That's where you get from. All right. Speaking of that, Lee, thank you. We also have Venmo. I don't know if you said that because I was waiting. But... Venmo? Mm -hmm. You found some Venmo as well. As we are going to do communion today. The communion. Oh, wait. More announcements. More announcements. Oh, my goodness. More announcements. Okay. Announcements. Next Sunday, we are doing a dinner here after church. Um, do we decide what we're doing? Decide. Do we decide what we're eating? Next it might be ham and bowling sandwiches. It Eat. might be steaks. We don't know. The church will do the meats. Yes, the church will provide the, the meats. So. And plates and cups and napkins. So, yeah. sides, yeah. dessert, something. And if we end up with and drinks. Sign up sheet. What? And drinks. We'll do drinks, yeah? Okay. I'm okay. Do you want to do a sign up sheet? Yeah, anybody that's really good at making desserts. That counts as a side. If you want to bring two desserts, that is, that's a, I think it's actually double points in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> extra right. crayon, extra. Anybody know what peach cobbler, apple cobbler? Peach cobbler? Or red velvet cake? Um, <laughs> he, he don't like asking about money, but he's all right with dessert. <laughs> <laughs> I can feel that one in my heart. We're going full speed after this. And this door is about to open for us. All right. Does that clear things up? We are working details out. We're, we're going to line this up where everybody can get involved in this. In whatever way you see fit. Communion. Yeah. Let's pass it. Communion is a contact point of faith. The Lord showed me the quickest way 
for a person to be springboarded into intimacy is through communion. No. Pastor Algo. Watching on Facebook Live, 53. You go to the bridge and partake with us. It doesn't matter if it's juice or bread. I've done communion with a, a tortilla roll. Yeah. I hear myself. I don't know what's going on, brother. I've done communion with a tortilla roll and a diet cook before. It's okay. The Lord said, if your heart is pure, you'll bless it. of reverence in your heart because your heart has to face what the Lord did in the flesh. See, the Lord came as a man. The Lord came as a man to, to fulfill what man could not fulfill. The law was put in place so that it exposes sin. So that man could see that we needed a Savior. <clears throat> you take communion, it, it opens up your heart to what the Lord accomplished and paid for. Like I said earlier, it's a contact point of faith. All of a sudden, it's not just a, a, a story we hear at Easter. It's actually something that you have to purpose in your heart, that you realize in your heart. A man's a place of reverence. Every time I do communion, comes over me so heavy of what the Lord paid for, of what the Lord accomplished so that he could put his life in us. It was never about a prayer to go to heaven. You can't even find that in the gospel. It was about him setting my sons and daughters free, bringing sheep back into the fold. Through his body, his body was beaten and broken beyond any measure of a man because when sin got done with Adam in the garden, man looked nothing like he was created to be. So the Lord took on the very image that was killing us. A man who knew no sin became sin in the flesh. Through the body of Jesus, we have reconciliation, a ministry of reconciliation. That means that the Lord made the relationship right again between God and man. For at once, at all the time, we were enemies with the Lord. Because when man fell, we didn't just take on the image of sin, we took on the image 
the, the, the identity of God's enemy. What a love, Jesus. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread. He said, this is my body. Take it. Jesus has set us free, has washed us clean of everything we've ever done. The blood of Jesus, I think it's in Hebrews where it says, He did not want the blood of bulls and goats, He wanted the perfect sacrifice. One that makes us perfect, perfected forever, Hebrews 10, 14 says. I know, I, I know what the Lord has washed me from, what he has set me free from. Just like every person in this room has been forgiven of something. <clears throat> That's the beauty of it. It doesn't matter what sin it is. It doesn't matter where at life we've been. When you're born again, the Lord sees His blood upon your name and it's always speaking better things over your life. Yes. It says that we have been made right through faith. Made, we've been made righteous through the faith of Jesus Christ. That's because whenever we're born again, the blood has washed us. But the Lord will never see us from where we've been. He sees what His Son paid for us to stir our hearts. Give us revelation of what you accomplished through your life and what your blood paid for us to become. The Lord said, this is my blood. Take Jesus for for your sacrifice. Amen. And because of that, we can enter into joy, right? Amen. Um, if y'all will stand with me today, um, we're gonna sing a Christmas carol. Any anytime I get to, to sing a Christmas carol, I'm so happy, so I'm thankful for this Christmas season. But we're gonna sing joy unto him today. So joy's the world. Amen.
So this this next song is a is a newer Christmas song. Um, some of you may know it, some of you may not. But it always speaks to my heart. It makes me cry every time. So I always try to get through it. But if you just listen to the words of it, it is um it's it's so it's so dear and it's so true and um, it's such a miracle the way that God came to us. Love incarnate, love divine, star and angels gave the sign, bow to babe on bended knee, the Savior of humanity.
If Jesus is who he is, and he is, but if he's who he is, he is God in the flesh, we're talking about God, a sovereign creator who loves us, who plant gives us a love letter about who he is, and now, now that his son has come and died for us, and by his finished work redeemed us, those who have received him and been born again, and we're free that his whole purpose was to get his image back into us so that we could know the Father, so that we could again take our place as a son with him. If that's true, he's not the first priority. He's the only priority. Because after that, he said, seek first the kingdom. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be given to you. His, our purpose is to look like him, to know him, to allow the intimacy that we have with him to change us so that we look like Jesus. Right? Amen. And have you ever wondered why it is that you see professing Christians who don't look like him? And sometimes I wonder if it's not that we have a lot of times enough understanding of that I am a sinner and I need a savior and have enough faith given to us by God to be born again. But that's where we stop. We don't go any further than that because outside of intimacy, Everything about God, everything that you learn in here, you're going to look at it the wrong way. And this is why you see often this taught in churches all across the country. It's taught as a principle or a means to live by or something to try to attain rather than who you've been made in him. Instead of seeing the scriptures as being this is where I'm heading. This is the fullness of God that is being birthed in me. I am growing up into the fullness of Jesus Christ. Instead of seeing it that way, what it becomes is a never-ending task list to try to achieve that you never can. And then you go to church on Sundays and you're taught principles. It's like a self-help class. Right? And, I'm one, and, and, and before I wondered, and the Holy Spirit was reminding me that what a lot of times it is, because, see, I'm, I'm a thinker. I don't know if you call me an intellectual, because an intellectual can talk himself right out of Christ. That's true. But I am a thinker. And I remember the Lord addressing this in my life, in my walk about the truth and reality of God, of Jesus Christ. And it's something that he showed me. Let's, let's all skip just the, the sciences and everything that actually point to God. I mean, things that how the world works that could never have been an evolutionary thing. It's just impossible. Because evolutionary things means there already had to be a structure already established for something to evolve from. So it couldn't just start out as nothing and then suddenly it come up with different things to be able to survive and to evolve into. But there's a whole lot there that just disproves the foolishness of evolution. Don't get me wrong. There is something that, that they, they tack, tack together and call it evolution. It's called adaptation. God made us and the bodies of animals and stuff wonderfully that we're able to adapt to environments and change and stuff like that to survive. But that's not evolution. You're not changing a species. All right? So let's skip all that. Let's go to just what most people would deal with whenever they're hearing God about God and think and talk about common sense. Okay? 
And the Lord took this and, and started dealing with me about what, how to realize the reality that God exists and Jesus was real, right? The biggest thing was this. Nobody dies for a known lie. Amen. If you've got a plot or a plan where you're looking to deceive people, that will go on until you finally start to have skin in the game. And then you've done it. Because I don't know about y'all, if I'm sitting there trying to scam somebody, and it finally comes down to either you tell me the truth or I'm fixing to kill you, man, I'm spilling my guts, and I'm going to tell you everything about you, your mom, and everything else. <laughs> The, uh, the disciples walked with Jesus and they saw everything that the scriptures talked about. That they recorded in the scriptures. They saw every work. They saw all the miracles. They saw the crucifixion. They saw the resurrection. They saw the resurrected Lord. Not just them, but 500 people. Over a period of 40 days, saw the resurrected Lord. And I've watched and I've listened to all, you know, as you go through school, you start listening, you start seeing, well, here's the things that people try to say to make it not true, you know, or to, to come up with, you know, the, the swoon theory and, uh, you know, the fake theory. The swoon theory is uh, Jesus just looked like he died. Oh. <laughs> but you see, here's the problem. The biggest one that you hear is that it was just all fake. That it all, the whole thing was a lie and a fake. Okay? Every disciple died a horrific death. For Christ. Every one of them. Died a horrific death. With the exception of one. And that was John. Which they tried to kill him. They tried to boil him in oil to kill him. And he wouldn't die. Mm. So they took him. And banished him. To the Isle of Patmos. Which was basically a prison island. To live out the rest of his life there. And die there. Because they couldn't kill him. I really believe that they couldn't kill him because he would not abandon Jesus at the cross. He was the only one that stayed with him, the, uh, the disciples that stayed with him the whole time. See, now these are men. See, now you've got to understand something. These are not born again men yet. They believe him who he is, but they're still messed up men. When all of this, when they came and got Jesus, the Romans wasn't playing around. Romans knew how to crucify people. They got it from the Japanese and then they improved on it. Their whole purpose was to make people suffer. It wasn't just to kill somebody. It was to make an example of somebody. So that the next person who thought about doing that would think about how bad that was and don't do it. So they wanted you to suffer on the cross for days. So when the Romans came and, and the, um, the priests brought their, their soldiers to get Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, it scared them so bad they all scattered. Want so much so that he run out of his clothes. <laughs> That's running. Yet, Jesus, well, yet the disciples, once they were born again, they never recanted their story. They never turned away from it, even though each one of them. Let, let, let me read through some of the things that, that happened to some of the disciples. Some of these in here are not, were not a uh, 
the, the part of the 12. Matthew, he was killed by a sword in Ethiopia. Mark, who wrote the Gospel of Mark, which was Peter, told him he wrote it down. That was actually Peter, Peter's version of what happened in Jesus' life. When you read Mark, that is Peter's di dictation to Mark. And Mark, he died in Alexandria, Egypt, after being dragged by horses through the street until he was dead. Luke, who wrote the Gospel of Luke, now Luke, he followed with Christ. He was amongst the, the people that actually followed him and dictated and wrote down. He's a doctor. That's why you see things more on an analytical level when you read the Gospel of Luke. See, the awesome thing that you see in all of the four Gospels is, is you see the personality of the person that's writing. Luke was hanged in Greece because of his preaching to the lost. John, as we said, he was saved. They tried to bowl him in a huge basin of oil, but he didn't die. He wouldn't die. And he actually died of old age, even being referred to, to by the church, calling him John the Elder, where he could understand just absolutely the most important basis of understanding God and understanding Jesus Christ. They said that he would get up, they, the church would ask him to have to speak something, preach some words of wisdom or something, and he would stand up and he would say, Look, my little children love one another. And sit back down. Peter was crucified upside down on the cross. Because he did not feel that he was worthy to die in the same manner as Jesus. Church history says that his wife was crucified right before him. And his last words to her was, remember the Lord. James, the leader of the church, that became the leader of the church in Jerusalem, he was thrown 100 feet down from the southwest pinnacle of the temple because he refused to deny faith. Now, you've got to think about this. He was one of the ones that was recorded when Jesus was speaking and talking about who he was that he, and, and expressing to the people that would hear him that he was the Son of God they called for his mother and family to come because they thought he was crazy. They came to get him. Now you see what happens after being born again. He understood the truth and knew the truth that his brother in the flesh was actually God in the flesh. And he worshipped him. He became the leader, the pastor of the church in Jerusalem. And whenever they came to him, he would not deny the faith. And they killed him for it. James, the son of Zebedee, he was a fisherman by trade. And when Jesus called him, he was beheaded in Jerusalem. Because he would not deny the faith. Bartholomew became a missionary to Asia. He was whipped to death. Andrew was crucified on an egg-shaped cross in Greece because he would not deny the Lord. His last words were, I have long desired and expected this happy hour. The cross has been consecrated by the body of Christ hanging on it. 
He continued to preach to his tormentors another two days until he died hanging on the cross. Thomas was stabbed with a spear in India during his missionary trip there. Jude was killed with arrows when he refused to deny his faith in Christ. Matthias was stoned and then beheaded. Matthias, if you don't know who that is, is the one who replaced Judas Iscariot. <clears throat> Paul was tortured and then beheaded by Nero in Rome. Simon the Zealot was martyred by being sawn in half. Mm. Philip, while he was evangelizing in Phygia, they tortured and then crucified him upside down. Every one of these were not, who saw. They knew the truth. They knew the reality of Jesus. Understand what I'm saying here. They knew it was all true. Yeah. If it's all true, God does exist. It is his son. There is only one thing that matters. That is your relationship being born again. Because see, if you, if you don't get the reality of God, it's easy to kind of make him just another addition in your life. Like, I have my work, I have my play, I do this, oh yeah, and I've got my God thing that I do on Sundays. He never gave you that option. It's either all of him or none of him. He doesn't play second to anything. See, this is why you see people that don't look any different after they say that they've been born again. They look exactly the same as they did before they were born again. They're still babes in Christ and not understanding the truth of who they are and who they've been made to be. Because they don't, and, and a lot of times I can speak it from my point of view. My thing was is this, is that I always back then, whenever I was a, a teenager and, and young adult, I stayed on, like on a fence. It was like I teetered to one side to the God side on Sundays and stuff, but I would teeter to the other side, at, you know, if it wasn't. You know, the world began to speak louder than God. And so it was easy to live my life the way that I wanted to. And I could always find a justification to do it. But all of that actually came down from a stemming from, do you really believe that he's real? Because if you really believe that he is who he is, you will not live the same. And you won't do it based on your trying to live a different way, you will develop an intimacy with your heavenly father. You will stay with him and spend time with him. Because see, this is the only way that real change takes place. Because see, you can't change you. You weren't able to change yourself before you were born again, and you can't change yourself after you're born again. That's right. He has to change you. Amen. That change comes from being with him. A true intimacy. I'm not talking about now I lay me down to sleep, Lord, I need this, 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 and this. I'm talking about being in his presence. Getting into his presence, 
letting his love overwhelm you and shutting up most of the time and listening to him. He told me that a long time ago when he was taught me to prayer. The first thing he taught me was to be quiet, to shut up, really. How can you have a conversation if you're the one that's doing all the talking? But that's how most of us have been used to praying. We have our petition. We'll have our prayer list. We'll have all these things that we want to talk about to God. And yet we never give God an opportunity to talk back to us. Maybe instead of him talking back to us, we start off being quiet and let him start the conversation. Maybe if when we start doing that, we can suddenly start having an intimacy with him of a true father who loves us, that we know his love. Because see, that's why Jesus said through Paul, he said that we would know the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. That we would know the depth, the height, the breadth, the width. Because see, if you don't know this, if you don't understand this, you will try to live your life based on a principle rather than a relationship. The intimacy is what changes you. It is what makes the relationship. It is what those things that you sit there and you struggle with that you want to be free from, that you never could be free from, suddenly they're gone. Because he says, I will give you the desires of your heart. Not that he's giving, you're going, hey, I want a new Harley. That's not the desires he's talking about. He's saying, I will give you the desires. The desires that you have now in you that you want. Those are lined up with mine. I will give you those desires. It's a game changer. It is the reality of being his. So uh, whenever I got free from that, when it, the, uh, that this, these questions... Because in my mind, once, it, once the Lord showed me this, that nobody dies for a known life, mm -mm. it satisfied in my mind that, that, that intellectual part of me. It even went on even further. You can, start, you can go right now and you can slip by writings in the Roman times during that time. Josephus and stuff like that, who were not disciples. Tertullian, stuff like that. People even who opposed Jesus, who wrote about him. The Romans equivalent of newspaper talking about Jesus and his crucifixion. They didn't even deny the things that he did. Many Christians deny the things that he did or, or try to make it only that God did can do it instead of uh, it's the Holy Spirit in all of us. But that's a whole nother story. <laughs> but the reality is, is that their equivalent in the newspaper talked about him being crucified. And they didn't understand the power of God in miracles. They said that he could do magic. Mm -hmm. So if they're saying that he could do magic, then guess what? He was really doing miracles. Tertullian would go set, talk about whenever they were going out and, and, and chasing down believers. The, the, he would bring, when they would, he notated that to the emperor. When they, because see, you've got to understand what they were doing. The Romans, their, their want was not to kill everybody. They wanted to stamp out Christianity. They wanted to stamp out anything to do with Jesus. So what they would do is, is that they would arrest people that were Christians or accused of being Christians. And then they would interrogate them. And if you would sign and renounce your faith or deny your faith, they would set you free. You could go on. And he made a note to the, to the emperor. 
He said, those who are truly the followers of Jesus, no matter what you do, will not renounce their faith. Which the antithesis of that is, is that those that were not of his had no problem in renouncing the faith. They would quickly renounce the faith because they loved their life more than they loved him. See, Christians, the Christians today in this country particularly have to come back to a foundation of loving him more than they love their own life. He said, those who love their life will lose it, but those who love lose their life will find it. In other words, if you love your life more than him, you're going to lose it. You're going to lose your life. But if you lay down your life like he said and take up your cross and know him, you will find your life eternally. The intimacy with the Father is so foundational. Everything that we see, I can take most every single thing in the New Covenant and teach about it, and you will always find me starting at the same point, at intimacy with Him. Because intimacy, intimacy and His love are synonymous. You can think about that as a bubble. That is the foundation. That is the beginning point of your life in Him. Everything else has to be birthed out of that state, out of that point. Everything has to, that you do. It doesn't matter if it's secular work. It doesn't matter if it's playtime. It doesn't matter what it is. If it's not birthed out of that point, You've missed it. And not only that, you, you're not going to receive anything from that. It's, it's going to change your whole perspective. Because see, when you live your life as a, in Christ as a principle that you're just trying to keep, eventually what happens is, is the very things that you're reading about in the Scriptures, rather than it being something that you're looking at and saying, this is where I'm going. Thank you, Father, that you're changing me and growing me up. I am sealed and safe and yours born again, saved, and I see where I'm going, and I see those things that are not of you, that you're pruning off of me, and taking off of me, and changing me. Instead of seeing it that way, you'll start looking at it as condemnation of where you're not. Right. Oh, this says I'm supposed to be this way. I need to work hard to get that. How many of y'all ever heard this? And you may even have said, I'm trying to forgive them. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to forgive, you ain't. Yeah. I'm trying to love them. Then you ain't. In intimacy, it becomes easy. It's not something you're doing. You can't help but to do it. You can't help but to forgive someone because that's who's in you. You can't help but to love them because that's who's in you. You've got his very nature. You, he took your old nature out and put his nature in you. And that's what's coming out. And then you'll see this as just a love letter saying, look at what I've done for you. This is who you are. Now, renew your mind. Learn of me. So that this is what comes out of you. Not something that you're trying to get to or accomplish. But this is who you are. So you understand something. God prunes all those things that does not produce fruit out of your life. That can be people. That can be sin. See, the right attitude about sin is, is this. There are people that struggle with different things. 
when their heart's pure, they want to be free from it. They're not trying to find a way to massage the Bible to make it okay that they do it. They know it's wrong. And they know in their life that it's wrong. And they're spending time with the Father going, Father, I thank you that you're changing me and growing me out of this and, and removing this stuff out of me. Because if your life is, is that something else and you're trying to find a way to be okay with it, you're going to find that you've opened yourself up to the enemy of condemnation. All kinds of stuff, bad stuff. You're just inviting it in because you gave place to the enemy. People in your life, there are people in your life that needed to be out. That is absolutely nothing but toxic people who are trying. And I'm not talking about not forgiving, not loving or anything like that. But there are some people that you just cannot fellowship with. Forgiveness and love is not equal fellowship. And there are some people that you have to cut out of your life. And then there are some people that you don't want to cut out of there because your heart's there and they've been friends with you or something in your life and you can't cut them out. But then the next thing you know, the Lord will cut them out for you. He'll prune those people and remove them. Because he removes those vines and branches that are not producing fruit in your life. And if you've got something in your life or someone in your life that is absolutely, he knows because he knows everything. He knows whenever that, he knows the entire life of a person. He knows that person will or will not come to him and give their life to him. He knows everything. He knows that that person there is going to be a stumbling block to you. And if they remain in your life, then they're going to cause you to stumble. And hold you back from the plan that he has for you. When you submit to him. As, and in intimacy. The next thing you know. You'll start seeing those people. Go. Sometimes you won't even know why they go. They'll just go. Sometimes they'll just contact you and say. I'm not going to be your friend no more. When they do. Go. Okay. Love you anyway. I'll pray for you. And then be thankful that the Lord removed what you could remove. See, there is a God is real. He is absolutely 100% real. The great deception is that that has been that has fallen over this world is that he isn't real. Because see, if he's not real, there is no morality. That's why you see people who are atheists and stuff like that, or people who just want to uh, deny the real God. Because there is no morality except what morality you decide. You become your own God and truth becomes relative. That's good. That's why there's such a fight. You ever wondered why atheists who claim that they do not believe in God fight so hard against God? And that don't cross anybody's mind. I mean, I don't believe in Pinocchio. But if you believed in Pinocchio, I'm not going to go plaster billboards all over the place and I'm going to go to the courts and try to find ways to stop you from believing in Pinocchio. I'm just going to roll my eyes and go. <laughs> <laughs> well then. <laughs> if they really didn't believe in God, that's how they would be approaching this. If you really didn't believe in God and you believed in relative truth, then when my relative truth is, is that I believe in God, you wouldn't have a problem with it. That's right. Yeah. 
That's because there is a reality that is given to every human being alive, that there is a God, that God does exist, that there is a creator. That's because why you will find throughout society, as far back as you can find, even societies that did not believe in the one true God came up with gods. This is before science started trying to say that there wasn't a God and all this other mess. Left to their own, in their own selves, they knew there has to be something greater than me. Absolutely. Because that is inbred in every person that is alive. Because they know in their hearts there is a God. It is time for believers to stop living like the heat. Because the heathen did, does the same thing that what a lot of believers do. And that is, we think that we're at a buffet where we can pick and choose mm -hmm. what we want to believe out of the scriptures. And the reality is, is that what we're trying to do is create a God that looks and sounds just like me. And that's okay with the things that I do. And that's how we believe the scriptures. Right now, right now, I, I, I couldn't believe this right here. And if there's anybody from the United Methodist Church, I apologize. But I posted out there. A statistic, it was off their own website. Their own website. There was a study done in the United Methodist Church. And they separated it into two classes, conservative and liberal. And they asked each side, they asked a, a, a groups from each one. And asked the liberals, it says, what is the number one influence for your theology? 6% said the Bible. 6. 6. Oh, wait. 6. 6% Six said that the Bible was the, what they based their theology on. But then the other shocker was conservatives, 41% was all that said that the Bible was their influence for their theology. <coughs> they said, both sides, the main thing was human reasoning. But the Bible says there is a way that seems right to a man that always leads to death. That's right. You cannot trust your own human mind to dictate that. Only God. But do you see what I'm saying? We have to be careful that we don't fall into that same kind of category. That we... Think our way right out of heaven. See, the idea, let me get, make sure everybody understands this. Jesus didn't come to get us into heaven. Uh -uh. I know that for some places that that right there would like be heresy. That's not what he did. He came to get heaven into us. Amen. He came to restore lost sons and daughters. That's what he came to do. He came to put his image back into us so that we look like him again. So that now we continue on with the things that the only thing, the only example that we have in Scripture, Him. We continue to do the same things that He did. And even greater things. We go out and we preach the gospel. We show and demonstrate the kingdom. Because there is no death, sickness, and disease in the kingdom. And that's what he did. Everywhere he went, he didn't go heal people because he was God. He was demonstrating the kingdom. He didn't even come as God. Y'all understand that? That's right. 
He came as a man, even though he was God. The scripture says in Philippians, he says that he laid us down his divinity. The echinosis. He laid down his divinity, his divine power. He didn't cease to be God. He just did not use himself as God to accomplish anything. He did all things by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's right. This is why you see the things that took place. You see him when he comes and gets baptized in the River Jordan by John the Baptist. You see all three of the Trinity at that point. You see Jesus, the Son. You see the Holy Spirit. It's talking about I see the Holy Spirit descending on him like a dove. And you hear the Father's voice in, from heaven. Yes. Say, this is my beloved Son. If he was going to do everything as God, he had no reason. We had no reason. We had no example. But he would have no reason to do all that. He's just going to walk around as God. But he did all things by the power of the Holy Spirit. He didn't need to do that. He was God. He even made that clear whenever they come to take him in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Peter tried to crush a man's head with a sword. Wound up zipping off his ear instead. Jesus popped it back on. In the midst of all that. But he says, don't you know that I could call ten legions of angels to set me free? They couldn't take him if he didn't want them to. He said, no man takes my life. This is the kicker. No man takes my life. I lay it down willingly. And he says, I, can, I will take it up again. I can take it up again. He's letting you know, I have the power to do this myself. But he did. Did the scriptures say that it was the Holy Spirit that raised him from the dead? The same spirit that lives in us raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Right? Mm -hmm. He didn't need to do that if he was God. I, or doing everything as God. So why would he do all that? He did it as an example to all of us. Where he lives inside of us and lived and had the power of the Holy Spirit living in us. To do the exact same thing. We go out and follow the same example that Jesus did. We go out and we spread the kingdom. We expand the kingdom. And the kingdom has no death, no disease. It has life. This is what it looks like. When we go lay hands on the sick, it's because when we go up, we say, the kingdom has come upon you. They see what the kingdom in him looks like. That's what's in us. The kingdom is in us now. This is how believers are supposed to look. <coughs> believers, if, if you look like you did before you were born again, you need to get with the Father. You need to examine yourself. Because I will tell you what, you don't get, God, God's not because of Jesus is not going wink, wink, nudge, nudge. I want to forget, you know, I'm, I'm okay with sin now. <laughs> I'm okay with everything the way that it, the, the, living in, in sin or, or doing sins and, and things like that. And, and I'm not talking about people who are struggling with something and want to be free. That's a whole different thing. Your heart can be pure in God and struggling with something and your heart cries out to him. Even after you've done something and you want to be free from it. That's why you get into intimacy with him and he changes that. It ain't about bat just being baptized. Baptized don't save anybody. Baptism is an outward confession of what's happened. It isn't a confession as a matter of fact. You got baptized in the days of Christ. That was a target on your back now. You could have been killed for just being baptized. Mm -hmm. 
That's what we do. When we get baptized, we can't reduce that down to being just a, a, a symbolic thing that we do. We are relating to the death, burial, and resurrection. And we're, it is a confession to that. That when you come up, you are new in him. But the baptism isn't what made you new. It was him and his finished work. Beloved, it is, we have to come to an under, a realization and walk in it of who we are in him. The reality of him because... I'll close it with this. The reality is that if you don't know him, the reality of Christ, you're always going to treat some, him as like a fictional character in a book. You may hope that it's all real and that when I die, I hope that it's really real and that I really do go to heaven. But that's not faith. That's a wish. If that's how your life is being lived, if that's how your thoughts are about this, you need to do a self-examination about whether or not you're his or not. Because I'm going to tell you what, I've seen plenty of people that were not born again that were just genuinely nice people, good-hearted people. And if you didn't know that they weren't born again, you would think that they were. Just because that's, how, that's their demeanor. But unfortunately, there's plenty of people that are really nice people that bust hell wide open every single day. Nice don't get you to heaven. Nice don't make you born again. Kindness is, is a byproduct of being his. But you can be nice because even the even the Lord said that whenever he was talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He said, those of you whose child comes to you and asks you for a bread, would you give them a stone? He said, or if they came to you and said, I want a fish, would you give them a snake? He said, those of you who are evil, now get this, those of you who are evil know how to do good things for your children. How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? So in that, there's a whole lot of lesson in that. But one of those lessons is He's making a claim that very plain. You can be evil and still do good deeds. You can still not be of him and do good deeds. It's meaningless because he said your good works are as filthy facts to him when you're not born again. But what the, from an appearance side of it, you can be uh, not born again and still do good things. You see people do that all the time. Giving the good causes and going out and help build, you know, houses for people who need them and stuff like that. Doing good things doesn't make you born again. Being kind and giving well wishes to people doesn't make you born again. When you're born again, you know the Holy Spirit in you testifies to that. Now don't get me wrong, I don't want to be throwing condemnation on somebody that is born again. Understand that if you're living a life that looks nothing, doesn't look like Christ, it looks just like it did before you were born again. It's possible to be born again and absolutely worldly. Not knowing who you are. As Paul said, like a man that looks in the mirror and sees who he is and then when he walks away, he immediately forgets what he looks like. Mm -hmm. 
God does, isn't playing. He's serious. He's, his son died to redeem us. So he's not playing with sin. He's not okay with sin. Sin, sin cursed the world. The world looks nothing like it did in the beginning. Man, unregenerated, looks nothing. Just like Casey said, looks nothing like he did whenever he was, whenever he was first created. I said, the world don't look anything like it did but when it was first created. I said, born again, I'm like, <laughs> The curse of sin, that's why it was so prevalent. That's why it says in, in Hebrews that one man, the sin of one man, cursed all the world and all the generations to come by one man's sin. It's not fun. It's not a game. It's not where God's doing a wee wee nudge nudge to us. He's not okay with our hidden sin. And it's really not hidden because He knows absolutely everything about it, even your thoughts of it. So, with every head bowed, every eye closed, 